Hey, Pronouncers, welcome back to the podcast. I'm your host, Bruce from Printavo. We've got Mr. Stephen Farrig out of Campus Inc. out of Chicago, Illinois today. Pretty sunny living room in Chicago. We've got a really awesome episode. Pete Lovelace, general manager over at Booster Enterprises, uh, originally from ThreadX as a speaker, but has so much to say. He comes from more of a business background. And this one is... I probably have some of the most clips to pull out that I think are really hard hitting. So great episode that you guys can listen to. But first, we've got our special sponsors and one extra one that has joined the group. Thank you so much to all of them. We'll kick it off. Graphic Source. So Graphex specializes in providing high quality, production ready art and dedicated staffing solutions for decorators around the world, um, such as Printavo Shops. With industry-leading quality on high-end color steps, professionally digitized embroidery files, pixel-perfect product mock-ups, and order entry solutions, Graphic Source is sure to make a positive, measurable impact on your business. Thank you, Graphex. Um, they are in our shop, uh, embedded in our Printavo. They help us out with our art, and we appreciate it. Easy way. You shouldn't be spending all day cleaning dirty screens. Easy Way's line of environmentally conscious chemicals will get the job done faster, more efficiently, and will cost you a fraction of the cost per screen. I actually want to jump over to our newest sponsor real quick, just to give them a quick shout out here is Supacolor. Supacolor, you guys have probably seen if you've been at the Print House First Conf or at any of the trade shows. Supercolor was created with the mission to make high quality heat transfers super fast and easy that anyone with a heat press can become a professional printer. And it's not just small shops. We actually go into a ton of bigger shops that are on Super. I know you guys use them too. They make it super fast and super easy by streamlining every step of the process from pricing, placing orders, receiving your transfers, and pressing them onto any fabric. The quality is awesome. I added that part. And Supercolor gives you the means to grow so you can focus on what you do best, designing, creating, and above all, selling. Multicraft. So I've been, uh, I've been talking to Dave Eggers, uh, who runs Multicraft underscore daddy, and he's getting a lot of followers, and uh, he's getting good at posting on Instagram. So if you don't follow Multicraft underscore daddy, <laughs> go ahead and follow him. If you need ink, supplies, or a daddy, Multicraft screen printing and digital supplies for over 50 years provides you with the top brands at competitive prices. Mention the Printavo podcast and receive an extra 10% off your first order. Boom. All right, let's jump into the show. In, so how, how much time do you spend in Champaign now versus in Chicago? Uh, I try to do like a couple days a week in Champaign. So like I start my, start my week in Chicago and then usually I'll go down like Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday or like Wednesday, Thursday. Is that with the team, you think, more of a thing, or is it, like, actually... Yeah, definitely with the team. Um, so then you, you spend time with the team there and then mesh, bond, and then come back up? Yeah, it's definitely just, like, being present and being there. It's probably less productive when I'm there. Why? Just you get tapped on the shoulder a lot? Yeah, I think they're less productive. I'm less productive. <laughs> but do you get tapped on the shoulder as much in the Chicago office or no? Um, or are you not the, there when you're uh, in Chicago? Prob probably the same. You know, like, I think if you're going to get good, quiet work done, you have to be alone. Yeah. Alone, <laughs> phone gone, no phone, no notifications. No distractions. Oh, AP. Oh, wait, hold on. Actually, there we go. Somebody actually wrote me. It's kind of funny. Um, I'm trying to find it real quick. They were talking about, oh, here it is. Uh, Bruce, you seem to have mastered the art of fending off distractions. Completely not true, but thank you, Scott. This is from Scott Dawson. He goes, you mentioned the other day in a podcast, you park your phone to get down to work. Any other tips? I get hammered with distractions all day from clients. What do you think, Pete? How do you, how do you manage that? Especially he says get hammered from distractions all day, especially with clients. So I'm a, I'm a big believer in batching work. So, you know, I, I schedule myself within five days, but I have specific times and specific days that I dedicate to specific types of work. So there are times where I just need to be heads down. And so I'll, we have a co-working space right around the corner. 
And I will go there from 7 a.m. till 9.30 or 10. And that's just my time to do my things. Mm. And then I'll have dedicated office time, usually from 10 till 1 or 2, where I'm in meetings and that's I'm making myself available to others. And then typically in the afternoon is team time. That's when I'm walking the floor. That's when I'm checking in with my team. But I've just found without putting up those boundaries and and really they're boundaries for myself of like, I'm not going to allow uh, personal time to take away from my team time, just like I'm not going to allow team time to take away from my productivity and task time. And so you just have to set those, those boundaries for yourself. And I also think change of environment is huge. I have difficulty getting my work done at the shop because there's just so many distractions. Like I want to go see what's printing out there. I want to go engage with a client that might be standing in the lobby, but where I can really crank out task oriented personal work is in remote locations like a coffee shop or something where I'm just not as distracted by what's going on. So I think change of environment's huge. Yeah. It's funny because we were just talking about this right before you came on because Stephen, his production is in Champaign, Illinois, which is two and a half or something hours from Chicago. But he's in Chicago right now. And that's how I was like, how, how much time do you split? Yeah. I mean, even when I'm in Champaign, I will still start my mornings at home yeah. and I won't come into the shop until hmm, 10 or 11 o'clock. Because I think the second I walk into the doors... Those next two or three hours are just, that's team time, you know, and, and, you know, these people want to talk to you and they haven't seen you in a minute or whatever. And you kind of owe it to them to do that. Um, sometimes I feel weird when I drive to Champagne and then I go into my office, close the door and I'm in meetings till like 3 PM. I'm like, they didn't even recognize that I was here. I, I didn't even, I wasn't even present today. I think, uh, Pete changing environments is you can't get into the right headspace. Like you can't go from visionary to accountant to like integrator, just like one meeting after the other, after the other, like, no, now I'm going to go do goal setting for the next two hours. Like it doesn't work like that. I find that too. The, the desk switch, the physical desk switch or location switch or chair move or something like that also like resets my brain in a way where if I'm stuck, or I, I'm just like super distracted. Just moving desks gives me the ability to refocus a lot better. In but um, it, it is it is interesting. We're fully remote though, so it's like we don't have that as much. But we have a lot more of the slacks and, and notifications there, and still getting dragged into different problems and then zooms. Oh, and then the other thing is I found batching, you mentioned batching, but I found batching meetings together helps. So the more that meetings get split out in between the day and there's these little gaps, the more you just get distracted and it's hard to refocus. So if I can put all the meetings from like one to four, where I know I'm, I have the least amount of focus, then the morning I can keep working. Now it doesn't always work like that, but I try. Yeah. we We've also... <laughs> And what I realized this over COVID because so many meetings were happening remotely, meetings were getting longer and longer and mm. we were accomplishing less and less because everybody was trying to multitask on the meeting. So you're staring at your Zoom screen, but you actually have a spreadsheet up and you know, you're checking the news headlines while the meeting's going on. So I instituted a rule that there's no additional technology in meetings. And if we're gonna meet Let's get the highest ROI possible and be focused on what we're actually meeting about, not what we have to do later that day or anything like that. And that's been amazing to see the efficiencies we've been able to gain by simply eliminating the potential for distraction in the meeting. Do you think, is there a balance though with that? With like, I guess because we're full remote, I, I sometimes I let that go on a bit because we don't get that water cooler chat in a way. So it's nice, but it does, it does burn 15, 20% of the time. I love the water cooler chat. What I, what I can't stand is 
when we're talking about something and I say, Stephen, what do you think about that? And you get this, uh, oh, okay, can, okay. can you repeat yeah. the question? It's like, right, right. you've been, you've been locked in, but you're actually locked in on something completely different. Yeah. yeah or like, fair. uh, let me take you off mute real quick. It's like, uh, I, I tell you what zoom meetings for me, my biggest pet peeve is cameras off. Really? I, I like, I like want you to be present. I need you to be nodding. I need facial recognition. Like I'm always panning the screen. Like I might, cause I don't know if you don't get those like votes of confidence. Like I'm hearing you. I just feel like I'm talking to nothing. I don't know. Are Peter, yeah. most of your meetings in person? About half and half. I mean, with our specific production team and, and kind of the floor management team, everything's in person, but uh, we're also part of a larger corporation. So I have meetings with other corporate VPs and things that are all over the country. And then a lot of client meetings that are remote as well. Um, but in anything that involves zoom, we, Steven, similar to you, we've got a, a requirement that your camera's on, that you're in a quiet place, distraction free. And we're, we work on the honor system, but just that you're not multitasking, that you're there, you've been invited to that meeting for a reason, so be fully present at that meeting. It, it doesn't bother me if, like, even there's, like, we have a lot of, like, uh, new parents and stuff. I think that's great when the kids are on, like, you know, I that never bothers me, or dogs or animals, pets. That's That always makes the meetings fun. Um, yeah. I just think, like, being present and turning everything on do not disturb when you're in a meeting, it's hard to do. It's it's definitely, it's it doesn't seem efficient, but, like, when you're a when you're a guest on a meeting, it, it just, you can definitely tell the difference. So Pete, give us uh, you know, we met at ThreadX. Um, we heard you speak and uh, we had been connecting on LinkedIn a little bit. T tell us about yourself. Give, uh, give listeners a, a couple minute intro. Yeah. Um, well, gosh, ThreadX was like the last big event before the world shut down. And uh, yeah. I've been craving community. I had to miss Long Beach, because uh, my mom had knee surgery that, that week. So I, I missed seeing you all and catching up, but um, it's great to be back virtually. And uh, my story, I think like a lot of people's, is rather unusual in how I got into this business. I certainly didn't set out to, to be uh, in the apparel decoration industry, but it found me and I'm, I'm glad it did. Um, I actually studied uh, in school and then had a, a pretty long and established career in hospitality. I worked for Ritz Carlton Hotels for a number of years, uh, running individual properties, but then finished my career with them at their corporate office in Chevy Chase, uh, then transitioned into independently owned and operated boutique hotels and restaurants. Uh, that's actually what brought us to Atlanta. Um, but as anyone who's worked in the hospitality industry knows, the hours can be uh, relentless. And as a young man moving kind of further into my life, married with kids, I was gone every night, every weekend, um, and work just became somewhat of an idol, but also took a lot away from other areas of my life that I really valued in and, and wanted to be more intentional around. Um, and so the opportunity came up to pursue and investigate some, some opportunities outside of hospitality. And I, I by that point, had a, a, a community of some really great entrepreneurs and leaders and business executives, and one of whom uh, had started and, and through an acquisition, a apparel decorating company that was actually acquired to be able to serve the main business, which was an events-based fundraising company. And they were having a heck of a time with it uh, because what they had purchased, uh, nobody internally knew how to run and the business was not what it said on the pro forma documents that they had based the purchase off of. And so, um, they were looking to build a leadership team and, and really try and figure out how to become distinctive in a really crowded space. This is booster and, uh, enterprises. This is booster. Yeah. And so, uh, after a lot of conversations, and a leap of faith, I decided to take what I'd learned in hospitality and commercial kitchens and hotel management and try and learn the apparel decorating industry and 
try and uh, grow this side of our business. And that was 2017. And so I'm coming up on five years and it's been a, a wild ride, but wow. an awesome time. So I got to ask, Pete, do you know how to print a shirt? Are you a good printer yourself? No, I'm definitely not a good printer. Uh, I have been exposed to both our manual press and our auto presses. And if I was the last person standing and we had to get an order out the door, I, I think, and it was a simple one to two color front, I think I could get it done. But that's, <laughs> that's the extent of my printing ability. Me too. Okay. So you're on the <laughs> side of if we were to make a hall of fame of like shop owners or shop leaders who can't print and shop leaders who can print, you're on, you're on team can't print. All right. Oh yeah, we're rec- we're yeah. recruiting, Bruce. This is good. Yeah, good. Welcome <laughs> to the team. Welcome to the team. I uh, we we have a wall of shame for prints that have just gone horribly wrong. Pete Lovelace's is uh, all of shame. I I take up a good portion of that wall with uh, attempts that have not gone well. D- does your staff just kind of like cringe, laugh, like look the other way when you try to like get in there and do something? They they laugh most of the time, but I'm also very open about the fact that they're the experts and I have no business tinkering in their area of expertise. How do you, because like, there's almost like a, you know, I think shop owners feel like I have to be such a good technical printer to be such a good leader. You know, I have to have a master of this craft to be able to like show others how to do it. Why is that not relevant um, in your facility? Part of it is I think just the mentality I came in with of like, there was no way for me to even fake it because I knew nothing. Um, And I think I, I honed that sort of humility and vulnerability actually in hospitality because I managed a property that had six restaurants and I had one of 65 certified master chefs in the world working for me. And I wasn't going to tell that guy how to cook. (laughs) <laughs> and so this idea of just surrounding yourself with experts in particular technical areas of specialization and then trusting them to do what they do, knowing that my position is general manager or chief operating officer, it's, it's a generalist position. So why should I be trying to manage and direct somebody who is clearly more talented, more capable in a particular technical craft like printing, let them do it. And my job is to make them as successful as they can be by providing resources, by making sure the model's financially sustainable, making sure we got the right training programs, the right retention programs in place, good good revenue generation, and all the things that are going to keep that person growing in their particular area of expertise. You, you know, I, I've, I've got the, uh, I've got the website up here. Not sure if you can see it real quick, but so just to understand a little bit more about, uh, booster enterprises, this is the site, right? Booster Yep. We, there's a, so, we're, there's a number, number of sites that we operate under, but booster is the, is the parent company, the holdings company. Got it. So do you guys really focus and excel then on fundraising? Is, is that the, the core niche? Yeah, the idea is we're a fundraising company. We have three verticals. We have a booster tech, which is our software program to power fundraising experiences or fundraising events. We have Booster Thon, which is a hosted experience that we do at 4,000 schools across the country. And then we have wow. Booster Spirit Wear which is our custom apparel company. Regardless of what vertical you you are partnering with us on, our goal is to raise you money. So even with our custom apparel and promotional products, the idea is to figure out a way for that product to raise the organization money, Um, which is why we do a ton with online stores. It's why we do a lot with uh, business sponsors for the shirts that we print, almost every shirt that we do for an event has business sponsors attached to it, and that shirt becomes a vehicle for fundraising. And we even have a service called Booster Connect that will work with the local businesses in your area to find sponsorships. And we actually sell sponsorship packages 
for those events. And then we produce all the merch to, to, uh, to, to celebrate those sponsors. So everything mm-hmm. from banners to yard signs to T-shirts to promotional products, you know, we're constantly putting sponsorships on those items to help raise money for schools. You know, Pete, it's really interesting that you say like, doesn't matter what vertical we're in, we're always there to make our customers money and fundraise. And that's like a, an inside out approach to like, you know, your why, what, how, like Simon Sinek, I guess like as a company, how, how do you instill that in your team every single day when they're just on press? Because I feel like I've heard you talk about this vision over and over and over again. Like what is company culture like at Booster? Um, we, the real, the real version of it too. Not, not yeah. uh, the corporate, you know. No, we, we joke. We put the cult in culture uh, because it is this extremely passionate, committed, exuberant energy that exists in every one of our businesses and amongst every one of our teams. Um, we've got a mission over the next five years to raise schools in America a billion dollars. So it's like GMV dollars. is that one metric that you push everybody to, to rally around. So we, we always say like, what's our part of, of our whole, right? The whole of booster is a billion dollars. The spirit wear division is going to raise over 10% or a hundred million of that in the next five years. And so every time we print a shirt, it's not just a shirt. It's money that we're raising for schools. It's a teacher's salary. It's new computers for the fifth grade class. It's uh, reducing the amount of free and reduced lunch that that school has to rely on. So it's connecting what is a very mundane thing, loading a shirt to something much bigger and then just constantly celebrating and reinforcing the impact that the shirts and the products and the things that we produce are having on schools in America. Wow. So Pete, give us some scale. When you joined the business in 2017, how big was the apparel division to where it's at now? So in 2017, uh, we were hovering right around two, two and a half million. Um, and this year and our fiscal year runs the, the school year. So we go from July one to June 30th, but we're on pace to go over 8 million, uh, by June 30th, which is awesome. Um, the other really cool part is the product mix has diversified significantly. So when I first joined almost a hundred percent of our business was just event shirts, long run, 650 pieces of very basic cotton t-shirts. And you fast forward now, that 8 million uh, gross revenue is comprised of a lot more things. Uh, A lot of e-commerce, higher end merch, a lot of promotional products, um, and still obviously a, a large portion of the event shirt category as well. Pete, of that eight million, how much of it do you think goes back to schools, or is that number not including what goes back to schools? So that number is not including what goes back to schools. Um, so we're probably, I mean, from the event shirt standpoint, which is about half of our business, four million. Our goal is every time we do an event shirt order, the school raises enough money from sponsorships to pay for that that apparel. So they're, they're, it's not costing them anything. And in a lot of ways, they're actually turning that into a secondary fundraiser and they're actually pocketing money on top of that. And then with all of our spirit wear and kind of smaller, smaller orders for the school, whether it be like graduation shirts or back to school spirit wear teacher gifts, we do a lot of that through an online store platform where we help them basically set a profit margin to turn it into a fundraiser for the school. So we're constantly sending $1,500, $2,000, $3,000 checks to schools after they've run a campaign with us. Yeah. So that just kind of flows through the business. Like 
if you make that money, it just exactly. goes straight to the school. You don't really look at it as revenue, right? No, our, our revenue is all captured in the sale to the school, but then there's a whole nother fundraising profit stream for the school that they're collecting based on markup of what we're selling to them or business sponsors and community support that they're getting through donations based on the apparel programs we're putting together for them. So gotcha. you, you actually said something too that I wanted to emphasize that I've tried and haven't really successfully been able to implement, but um, you have what's called a big, hairy, audacious goal, which BHAG, BHAG. I've, I've heard in some other companies too, which you've aligned with gross merchandise value, GMV, of $1 billion. And um, you can use that to emotionally charge and push forward with the team to say, hey, we want to get to 1 billion. I'm sure you've got it, like a temperature thing on the wall and, and everything. And yeah. like, you know, like you said, celebrate the the progress towards it, which is really cool. I, I, I have tried and maybe, maybe... You're not crazy enough, Bruce. Yeah, I feel like I need the, I, the billion number of something, but I feel like there's just so many things that we have to focus on to improve, but I love that focus just on one goal. I mean, there's obviously a lot of incredible research and information out there about goal setting, about ways to do it. I've been a, a loyal believer in the 4DX principle, four disciplines of execution. What's that? If you haven't read that, if you haven't read that book, read it. It basically talks through how to set a goal uh, uh, or how to execute a goal setting process around a BHAG and then the the elements you need to put in place to make progress towards that BHAG and the biggest thing that you fight is the whirlwind is kind of what we're talking about right when we started of like you walk in the door and you're just inundated with all the day-to-day stuff i.e. the whirlwind that just never ceases Sure. But if you want to tackle something bigger than just an annual revenue projection or a new, a new market share target or something like that, you've got to create space in the whirlwind to really focus on that. And the best way you can do it is just with an ongoing cadence of accountability. So we deal with everything that every other print shop in America deals with. Um, the difference is we've carved out 20% of our day, of our week, of our month to focus on this billion dollar goal. And every week, our leadership team gets together and we throw up a scoreboard and we say, how are we doing? Are we winning the game? Are we tied or are we losing? And it's a it's kind of the, the ultimate moment of truth as we go around the room and everyone red, yellow, green, how am I doing to this billion dollar goal based on what my responsibilities are for this goal? Pete, tell us about the leadership. Tell us about the leadership structure. Obviously, like you're, you're up there. How, you know, are there several CEO, like CEOs and partners above you? Like what's that circle look like that really powers this business? Um, so the best way I can describe it is it's a little bit like General Electric. If, if, you know, GE has a number of different companies under it. So those essentially are our three business verticals, Booster Tech, Booster Thon, Booster Spirit Wear. So um, I report up to a CEO, founder, owner, and also a president and chief operating officer of all of Booster. Uh, but essentially, I'm the, the, the president of the, the apparel and product division. And then there's a person in charge of the events division and a person in charge of the tech division. And then we have a corporate office that provides the key support functions, operations, human resources, marketing, um, IT to those three business verticals. So the senior staff, so to speak, is the CEO, the CFO, the COO, and then all the presidents of the different business verticals, and then all the vice presidents of those key functions, marketing, HR, 
uh, finance, all that stuff. Wow. Was, was that structure put in place when you got there in 2017 already? Or like, you know, I think it's fascinating to look at company org structure and, and how it's developed. Yep. How long has that been there like that? It's evolved because when I, when I got here in 2017, there was no uh, apparel division and there was no tech division. So we were truly a one trick pony. We had a great event based business uh, which we thought was recession proof, but now we know it's not because every school in America <laughs> shut down and we had no, no revenue from that business for 180 days. So thank God we had tech and apparel because we probably wouldn't be here having this conversation today. Um, so it's evolved as, as new businesses have launched, have new product lines have come on as we've expanded our competencies, we've had to reinvent the structure to support it. Um, Structure always follows strategy. So the way things typically work is that team I just described is developing multi-year strategy on either how to grow the existing business or how to potentially penetrate into a new market or a new industry. And then the structure comes behind that and we figure out what do we need to, to run this effectively. You know, um, were you guys brokering out a lot of the work then before? Since you, you bought the shop and then, okay. And so then what, what was the thought process of bringing it in house? Um, honestly, we were naive and ignorant and, uh, I, I have a whole lot more respect for, for <laughs> shop owners and printers and everything. Cause we just thought we could do it better and cheaper. Um, and we were frustrated to be honest with you, cause the people we were working with were just not as responsive and excellence driven as we sure. were. So it always felt like that was the one thing we couldn't control. And that was always the one thing that negatively impacted our business is because we were having to do more write-offs and more comps and more problem resolution because of the apparel stuff. Um, now operating six presses and, and we put out about 4 million pieces a year. I get it. It's not, it's not easy and things happen. Um, but we do feel like we're more in control of the experience when it's under our roof and, and where we're operating it versus outsourcing it to somebody else. Do you, does that mean you don't outsource anything whatsoever? No, we still outsource some, uh, yeah. try and keep it less than 10%. I always say like, we don't build the church for Easter Sunday. So in October we're we're at max capacity. <laughs> Uh, the rest of the year, I can I can keep it all in here. But in October and April, we're we're outside of our capacity limits, and we have to outsource. How do you deal? Because Farag, you're very similar, right? With schools, um, how do you guys financially manage the the ups and downs, and you know the lulls? You got summer, you got breaks, and things like that. Um, it's really hard. <laughs> uh, yeah. We say we have to we have to crush it eight eight months of the year. All of the months that start with J plus December do not help us. Um, yep. And so, and so, you know, I look at my numbers from a year and say, like, what do I need to do in a year? But in the back of my head, it's like just brace for like, like, just brace for impact. <laughs> like January, I mean, just just to give some scale, we'll do five to six hundred grand in December, and then our January could be almost a third of that um, because like schools are just you know college kids are just gone. And so like my payroll is still huge. It's not like I can just send everyone home. Um, so on I kind of have too. to like look what? <laughs> so you send them on break too. <laughs> and it's really not my production, like the production staff is, is, is a lower cost of, of that. Like, you know, so I just kind of have to like look at it and just say like, okay, you know, what are we going to just do for this month um, to make sure we add a ton of value so that when that dip in February is over and it starts to go back up, we're back to cruising altitude. Um, but it makes your stomach drop a little bit. I don't know. Pete, how do yeah. you guys forecast? Um, we're, we're pretty similar. I mean, we, we will do 60% of our annual revenue in August, September, October, November. So four months. So similar, similar kind of thing. Um, a couple years ago, I went out and, and really pushed to acquire some big fulfillment programs. 
Um, so we have two that we use those down months to just, and I'm talking like 20, 30,000 shirts. We'll use July, June to print those programs and then put everything on the shelf and fulfill it throughout the year. So that's helped kind of offset some of those lulls um, to just keep, keep the presses moving and keep people working consistently. But it's, it, to your point, when there's no revenue coming in or it's not coming in at the pace it is in, in the fall, it, I just am a lot more mindful of we've got to be we've, we've got to be good financial stewards of the business, especially in these months, because there's no revenue to mask the sins of expenses. What about, uh, you know, you talk about being from hospitality. It, coming over into this world and obviously, you know, you, you've got a really good balance on the business side, but uh, also helping on manage on the production side too. What, what do you think are some of the takeaways that, that you've pulled from that hospitality experience? I think our industry as a whole has a long way to go with client care. Um, and back to the question earlier, like you need to be focused on your, on your client. And I think there's a lot of shop owners that are more in love with the craft, mm -hmm. which I certainly appreciate and respect. But if you are not, if somebody in the organization who has influence is not focused on the customer journey, you're, you're really going to struggle. Um, and so you've just, you've got to be obsessed with your customer experience the perceived value that you're offering to a customer. Um, and we go to some pretty exceptional extents never to lose a client. Um, and we actually don't call them customers. We call them clients because we want that mentality of a client is somebody you are committed with for a more long term. Doctors have clients. Lawyers have clients. We have clients because these are people we want to work with over multiple years and really embed into their operation to serve them with a higher level of personalization and care for what, they, what they're trying to accomplish with us. And so Pete, tell us, how, tell us about the sales and customer service team. Like, is there a separate team that acquires customers and then a separate team that keeps them? Like, what's that structure look like? Yeah, we're, um, we're more farmers than we are hunters. Uh, partially because we derive a lot of our business through the leads and client base from our other two businesses. So our tech business generates probably the most inbound activity because it's a free software platform. So people get on with that. They experience kind of a low touch solution. They have some results and then we can start generating leads and interest from them because we've already got them in the funnel. And at that point, we can move them to more of a high touch. I think that's interesting when you talk about customer funnel. So like your tech platform is making, you know, they're using it, but that's also your customer acquisition strategy. Right. And I've heard about shops, you know, so like we run tons of online stores. Once they come into our stores funnel, we try to convert them into the B2B funnel. And yep. shops shouldn't be hesitant about that. That's how that's how people will be like, well, if they bought from an online store, should I market to them? Heck yeah, you should. Yeah. Like they're they're a part of you now, you know. Um, I don't know. Do you get Bruce, what do you think? Because you've heard this before. Yeah. I mean, you absolutely should. I just don't think a lot of shops have the infrastructure to do it. So, you know, the the marketing or the ability to then have a like a sales rep go through that list, maybe even do some research who these people are connected to LinkedIn or whatever. But even just a mass blasted email, I feel like you know, is a good start. I, I'm starting to work with a marketing agency. Um, oh yeah, did you actually, kick that off yet or no? We're going to be kicking that off with one of our brands, um, and it's going to be you know it's going to be the cost of an employee for a year. Um, it's not going to yeah. be in, inexpensive. But they're so good at it. I was just like, holy cow, like they're going to wire things together and, and just get things moving for me. And so like when shops say like, oh, I don't know how to connect Zapier to Stripe to like send a customer journey. 
it's worth, you know, what is, what is that worth to you? You know, and, and finding an agency to do it for you. If it's a thousand bucks a month or 2000 bucks a month, that could be the best way you get leads. If you don't have anything um, right now, you know, um, I mean, Pete, how much of like, how much of sales and marketing, like, uh, let me ask you this, like returning customers versus new customers. Do you guys look at that ratio and that number? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. We're, um, we're right around 70, 30. Uh, so 70% of our business is returning customers, 30% is new. Um, the other thing that I, I really had to educate myself on is the client acquisition cost. And you've got to value time in that. It's not worth it, in my opinion, to spend a whole lot of money to get a $1,500 order. So the more you can rely on automation and virtual or digital marketing to bring those leads in, if we've got a qualified hot lead, I'm happy to have one of my team members jump on the phone or jump on a Zoom and do a a 30 minute consultation. Because at that point, the potential for conversion is very, very high. But when people are just out shopping to be investing all that time up front, especially with the kind of company we are, we are not the cheapest screen printer. So if all people are looking for is an order of 36 shirts, we're probably not going to be the best option for you. But like I said, if you're looking for more of a multi-year partnership with an organization that can raise you money and consult on a lot of different innovative techniques to boost your merch program, that's, that's where we shine. But it's sometimes hard to get that across through the typical inbound marketing channel. So we rely a lot on, on digitizing and, and automating those inbound leads to qualify them and then invest more time once we, once we know it's worth their time and worth our time. How do you qualify? So um, a lot of times it's really through the email drips that we have. Mm-hmm. So we're asking questions or including a video or a sample store or something like that to be sure that this is what the client is looking for. Mm-hmm. And then we have a lead gen form or something like that where they fill that out and they give us some information based on what they've just received, whether it's a video or something like that. And that kind of lets us know, okay, this this person is is the Legit. right type of client. It's kind of to like rated with. them well. Is there is there a CRM behind that that sort of lead scores this or? Yeah. Uh, so Stephen and I just caught up a little while ago. We we run Salesforce. Ah, okay, um, which got is it. A, a behemoth. For sure. Uh, but with all the with all the elements we've added, we're we're able to to run a really robust lead gen and, and qualification process. Got it. I, I think where where I'm inspired and what we're working on um, is, you know, we're looking at like what's the potential of that customer. And so we'll ask our team, are we are we doing this first order as a marketing tactic? Like what's what's right. the intent here? You know, and what's the long term value of this client? Are they one and done? Are we just a favor for them? Do we genuinely like them? Do they have a connection that we're interested in? Um, but the hardest thing to do is to look at someone who's not qualified, still give them the care that you should do, but not spend any more time. Um, because that's, that's the time suck are the orders under, you know, a thousand bucks. Um, they're awful. And I mean, I think that's in any business, right? Like Bruce, it's always the, the standard plans that probably need more support. Um, you know, we haven't ever measured it, but we have a plan that's 49 a month. It's not, uh, it's not a profitable plan really. It it basically breaks even, but our hope in our test is that people upgrade into it. So the, the upgrade into a future plan and then can continue run. But obviously there's a heavy lift and we're pretty negative for a little while because of all the time to implement somebody and get them running and stuff like that. But yeah, that's a fair point, right? Just on the lead qualifications and stuff. Um, as we, 
Yeah, actually, you know what? Thinking about KPIs, this actually brings me back to the hospitality side a little bit. Were there any good KPIs and metrics that that from any side of the business that you were using before that you brought in or tried to replicate in some sort of fashion? The capacity and output was a big one. In in commercial kitchens, it's all about ticket times. Like when you go dine in a restaurant, you you might not even realize this, but you're kind of conditioned to wait about 20 minutes for your meal from the time you order. And then you start looking at your watch and you start noticing food coming out to other tables and you start noticing the servers avoiding your table because something's probably wrong in the kitchen. And that's typically about the time. So um, we we really we had no idea what our capacity was. Um, and so understanding that not only from an impression output, but just what our overall effectiveness of equipment was and how much could we actually push our, our equipment to produce given the hours of, in the day that we had to operate. That was a huge one. Um, cause I also wanted to cut down on the turnaround time for orders. It seems like a lot of people are 10 to 15 days and I wanted to try and get it to seven days to where we could just run standard seven day turns on everything. Um, but that meant things had to be in a certain order to be able to do that. Um, because everything from inbound blank goods to staging and receiving to printing, shipping, all that stuff had to be worked into that seven day schedule. Uh, graphic design is also a big piece of that. So we've overhauled a ton of things to in basically improve those ticket times, right? To get that food out fast, but fresh and accurate. Same idea. We're moving things really fast here. Gotcha. That's pretty interesting. That's a, that's pretty interesting. Like I know Bruce and power scheduler, you guys are starting to like capture the data to be able to track time. Um, but I wonder if a shop measured when their shirts came in the door and when the shirts left, how like normalized that would be. Um, or like actually started being conscious of it, you know? Uh, cause I, I don't, I think we don't, we don't know if we don't measure it. I guess Pete, do you guys like, or is that from quote guys, approval to turn around? Like what, what is the, what is the range? Well, well you could look at like the sales process, like how quickly do we close yeah. an order? And then we could look yeah. at how quickly to fulfill it. Right. We've found that from on the closing side, that's really subjective. Um, cause we just, we've got clients and we'd like to get in touch and work with people with longer time frames. Um, so we got people that'll drag their feet for a variety of reasons. Um, what we're most concerned about is that turnaround time. So from the time we call it closed one, basically the order is finalized and submitted to production to the, to the time it ships out, the goal is seven days. And we have it all broken down to like, this is how much time it should be sitting in uh, blanks ordered, order received, staging, order printing, order produced, shipping. And so we've set up our, our workflow to actually have timestamps on all that stuff. So every day we have a meeting at two o'clock and I bring up the dashboard, which has every live order in production at that moment. And if it's past its, its allotted time in that particular stage, it's red. So the team knows at two o'clock, if the dashboard's covered in red, it's not going to be a, a good day because <laughs> we got to get back to green. But I like just the visualization just of making, it. Giving all that, that simple visualization, red, right. yellow, green, and just – knowing where you are and being able, I mean, just like a dashboard on your car, like just being able to glance down and know what's going on with this expensive machine right. is absolutely critical to successful uh, management of the business. You know, Pete. Ryan, Ryan Kasperian was in our shop last week, uh, spent a oh, couple yeah, of days go? and we were talking about measuring stuff and, you know, he got out a pencil and paper and printed out sheets of paper and said, you're going to learn how to measure with paper first and then we'll automate it later. Um, and so it was really interesting because like, I feel like shops feel like it's just a hurdle to start measuring stuff. But he's in, in factories and in bigger warehouses, there are people that are writing things in and there's still manual work to be done. It's not like you can automate everything. 
Um, Pete, do you have, do you rely on a lot of your employees to input a lot of information from time to time or is a lot of it like using like a lot of tooling or what do you expect from like people on your floor? It's, it's both. And we, uh, after Ryan was on the show a couple of weeks ago, I guess, actually maybe a couple of months ago at this point, uh, we had a, a consulting call with him. He's coming in April to spend a week with us. I mean, the guy is a stud and I love how metric focused he is. But you're right. It's, it's, you don't need a $50,000 cloud-based system at every press to do this. You need a conscientious team member and a pen and a paper. And it's amazing how those little behaviors every day can lead to massive improvements for the organization. Um, so we do. We have a sheet at every press. And after every job, there's breakdown responsibilities, one of which is you fill out the sheet and you put in your breakdown time, your setup time, your run time, any fallout, all that stuff. And then it gets logged. And then the system that it's logged into has the ability to kind of manage that big data, run graphs, run charts, run assessments. But it starts with simple pen and paper, just writing it down. Um, and again, and Ryan really pushed us on this. What are you doing with that data? How are you connecting that big data to the individual habits for improvement of each operator, of each catcher, of each press associate? We weren't doing as well of a job with that. So that's been awesome to then be able to actually bring that back each week to the team members and coach them individually on here's where you need to improve. Here's what you what you're crushing it with right now. Here's where I'd like to see you next week. We're going to add another job a day to your to your press because we believe you can do it. Yeah. Right. Shouts out to Ryan Kasperian with a K. He keeps coming up more and more with different people. So it's pretty yeah, awesome to hear him make that transition awesome. to a consultant. Pete, wrapping up, any any last tips you feel like that uh, shops, you know, getting started, growing up, wants to be uh, a fundraising powerhouse like you guys, or even just a, a customer service powerhouse that they can take away or books, anything? Um, I Just this principle. I think one of the things I, I see a lot is – Shops trying to be all things to all people. Um, and I think that's dangerous. And I know, Stephen, we've talked a little bit about this. Like, there's opportunity to chase everywhere. But the fact of the matter is, the riches are in the niches, right? If you can really specialize around something and be distinctive in a, in a, what is a very crowded marketplace and, uh, and typically measured by price point alone. You're, you're not going to be a, most shops are not going to be able to compete on just pricing. So you've got to differentiate yourself some way. Um, and I just challenge whether it's a big shop or a small shop, like what is distinctive about your shop? Who, what niche are you serving? How are you creating value beyond just the shirt or the garment that you're printing? There's got to be some higher ROI for the client and for your business. And until you're clear on that, I think you're, you're going to struggle to grow and you're going to struggle to really win the hearts and minds of your team because nobody wants to just be generic and nobody wants to be average. Um, you got to stand for something, but you got to be really clear on what that is and then start to measure the hell out of it. Oh yeah. I love it. This is awesome. This is Pete Lovelace, everybody. COO, general manager, general everything <laughs> at Booster Enterprises. Thank you so much for joining us. This has been great. Yeah, I appreciate it, guys. Thank you guys for listening. We'll see you guys in the next Pronouncers Podcast next week. Mm-hmm.